I believe uh, architecture is simply an extension of life. I'm reminded of one story where a pupil goes to learn architecture and the master tells him that son, I can only teach you architecture only after you understand sculpting because architecture is three-dimensional form and you must know about scale, proportion. So go and first learn sculpting. So then he goes to a sculptor and sculptor tells him, son, I can't teach you sculpting till you know a little bit about dance because there is expression, there is pause, there is rhythm. So you must first learn about the dance. So then he goes to a dancer. Then dancer tells him further and says, I can't teach you dance unless you know music because it's about, again, pauses, rhythm, and you must know all these uh, nuances. He goes to a musician. He says, unless you know poetry, I can't teach you dance. Then he goes to a poet and poet says, son, poetry can't be taught. It comes from life. Look around and there is poetry all around you. So the whole point is that it's actually looking around, absorbing, assimilating, interpreting, and then applying in what you do. So architecture in a sense is therefore a sum total of culture, craft, art, climate, that is environment, and construction. And all this come together, it becomes an aesthetic experience. In other words, architecture, it's to emote. A good architecture is not just an act of building, but it must inform, it must involve, and it must inspire. So it's that quality which kind of engages any onlooker to the given subject. Having been raised in a middle class joint family, we were even 11 siblings and therefore resources had to be optimized. And in that, it kind of got the most out of your own and creative urges to create things out of nothing. Probably around in 70s, uh, the other kind of thing that worked on was uh, our house was getting built and that time that many years ago, about 50 years from now, there was still a concept of architect in our kind of uh, circuit. Of course, he was not qualified architect in terms of architecture, he was an engineer architect. Nonetheless, house being designed by an architect got me into a bit of that exposure. And that is where probably this kind of fancied into my mind. And I remember having told my, I was very young and my family friends that whenever I used to pass by Sept University, which was very close to my house, uh, I used to say, this is my school and I'm going to be here one day. Not even knowing what architecture is, not even knowing I ever entered that campus. But I think even that building and that aura of the kind of learning that you might have been going on there had fancied me. And that's how, as the chance would have it, I got into architecture and it is then since it is just the kind of that spirit of assimilation that whatever comes your way without really questioning that I want to do this or this then uh, I got a chance to go further for further studies to Canada and Montreal and McGill University you know I believe that uh, given a chance and that also the world teaches you a lot more. So of course, uh, places become the excuses, as we call it, nimit. But I think what you get from there, for example, our department was multicultural, multinationality student department. Uh, and we got to learn from each other a lot, right from different kind of cuisine. We used to have a tradition of potluck then to their cultures, their ways of life, their languages. Uh, and so and so forth. So I think a lot of such exposure value, a lot of such rationalizing and seeing multiple points of view about the same thing. You came back not only concentrating and consolidating the values that you were brought within through Indian cultural grind, through the kind of a joint family system, the idea of caring and sharing. I don't think I lost that, it got strengthened and yet it gave me some additional exposure that few things that we would have taken for granted just because we continue to do this without questioning it. So some of such 
understanding and grind uh, kind of gave a little bit of conviction about certain approaches in life as well as in design. And that has been the kind of journey and the makeup. Uh, and since when I started my uh, own uh, practice, I named it Footprints Earth. Earth stands as an acronym for environment, architecture, research, technology and housing. So simply to complete that architecture is a whole encompassing entity and therefore I think all these come together and we have continued on the trifold uh, uh, you know, dimensions of uh, architecture that is one is the research, then is applied research and then it's dissemination. So we continue to uh, look into several issues then given a chance apply it in our design and then of course share it with the larger audience through books, publications, lectures and so and so on. So it's been a kind of a engaging journey and uh, all the day it has been sort of inquiring all the kind of exploring idea of uh, what the world wants to unfold. I studied in a very vernacular medium. So it was never the language as the kind of thing that naturally got into that. And I want to emphasize this, that communication is not so much dependent on your proficiency of the language. It has to do with clarity of a thought. It has to do with validity of a thought. It has to do with consistency of a thought, you know. So, in fact, having been raised uh, in local medium with uh, a kind of a vernacular language family, when I got into architecture, language was a little bit of a diffident thing for me. It had a little bit of a complex value, inferiorly complex. But I think it was the best way to express what you had thought within. Because when you write, you have to be precise and you have to own what you think. And I must say that uh, Mr. Doshi tasted me out for some of these things uh, when I was at Vastachal Foundation. And that gave me a little confidence. And then I started writing articles. An article was only a medium to share the kind of thoughts, the kind of uh, ideas, the kind of concerns, and kind of alternatives that you wanted to present it to whatever rest of the world. And I think it is in that light, with no research money, with no kind of uh, mandate, but purely that whole kind of a passion to share a few things and put it down, that the first book, Concepts of Space in Traditional Indian Architecture, came about. It was simply a personal inquiry that why these uh, thousand or millennia old uh, monuments continue to inspire awe in our mind, while many new buildings, which might seem glamorous once, twice, thrice, but then you don't even give a second glance. And architecture is created by such sort of uh, assembly of elements. So how do you create experience? You don't have to conceive architecture as room after room after room. It is actually a space, and space can be created by just a race platform. What we do when we go to a park, that you just spread a sort of a you know handkerchief or a mat and you created a space. I used to uh, take initiative and we had this Tuesday talk initiated at Vastashil Foundation and Michael Tava, an Australian professor had come to lecture and he had given lecture and he talked about just few ideas of the element called column or the door and he said door, the word comes from dwar, the realm of two. And it kind of triggered to me that probably each element, because that is the kind of set of kit with which we create architecture, and each has a role to play. So dissecting architectural space making into the basic elements and what is the spatial role of each. And that is where it triggered, that is where I think that again a decade old uh, lecture came back to kind of give me certain clues and give me certain uh, ideas and inspiration about having to inquire that and that is how these elements of architecture came in. There are multiple dimensions in this question. Uh, one, architect as a professional. As a professional, you are in a sense mediator 
to the larger good of the society. Even though client employs you, you are actually fulfilling his need by keeping, by mitigating, by negotiating with the collective good. So it is essentially a society's obligation, a society's kind of trust on you that while you work for an individual need, you would have ensured that there is a collective kind of uh, good that has been respected, that has been kind of ensured. So as a professional, you have to look for collective good. And in that, in that responsibility, therefore professional obligation, you have to be responsible about certain things, which is one is environment, that whether individual client asks for one or the other, you have to see the larger ecological balance and the kind of implications of your design decisions, which may affect negatively to some other things. Uh, Similarly, the cultural ethos that because of your kind of design decisions, it should not hamper the kind of uh, synergy. You know, existence has two fundamental notions or two fundamental equations. One is the harmony between human and human and the second one, human and nature. And as long as you respect these two in whatever dimensions of design, I think you have answered the call of the profession. The other one is, as an architect, you are multiply responsible for what you do. One, to begin with, you are intervener to the existing landscape, which means whenever you create something, you have altered that landscape and you have to be aware about the consequences of those design decisions. Second, architecture arguably lasts beyond you, your lifespan, and therefore even your mistakes can perpetuate for much longer. And therefore, you have to be aware that what you create is not only harmful for now, but it should even sustain for time to come and not create adverse effects. Third, if we go by the statistics, architecture or the built industry accounts for nearly 42% of energy consumption, an equally very high proportion of resource consumption, as well as the kind of pollutant that we create. And in that, therefore, we have to be aware that our design decision should not unduly be one creating pollution and second, on the other hand, be consuming more than the so optimization, conservation of resources and all those are inherent obligation of what we create. And as somebody has said, one more obligation is that the, we are shaped by the environment around us and we shape as an architect the environment around us. Okay. I remember as a student day, I was uh, probably in the late evening lecture and those days there was no internet, there was no other social uh, group. It was only through such passing lectures that you got anything beyond what your school taught you. And I think some of those things have still haunted me. Not knowing the meanings and consequences then, but that sincerity of the cause that no, you must attend the lecture. And I remember there was an architect, not really that known, but Adele Santosh, once a professor, and she had been building her own home, converting in Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, the warehouse to her own house. And what way she explained the staircase, that staircase became like a, in a given one singular volume, a dividing element, staircase became a sofa kind of a seat with lower three steps. Staircase became a kind of a amphitheater to project the movies and have the premium. So it became a kind of auditorium seats. Staircase became ledges for her, you know, African art display. And moreover, it was of course a storage and many things. It was a light shaft to bring in a warehouse from the sky, the illumination. But one thing that has still haunted me is that she mentioned that we are taught never to tweak riser and tray. And in her staircase, she explained that I have tweaked a little bit the risers as I go vertically up because I wanted to feel the sense of ascent, which means that risers become a little steeper as I climb up. So I feel that I'm ascending. And when I come down, it becomes a little smoother with a little reduced kind of riser. So even to think like that, and that was about more than 30 years ago that I'm talking about, but 20 years later, it so happened that I wrote this book, uh, Elements of Space Making, and from my memory, 
I had sketched and I had kind of put down those uh, observations. So simply that idea of assimilation and seeing things and thinking through that and picking what kind of interests you, what sort of makes sense to you and keeping it in your hard disk. So whenever you give a little uh, keyword, it will come out uh, naturally to you even later. So it will stay dormantly. So never be shy of getting information or being involved with uh, such discussion and be always with alert mind thinking about it. You find your own meanings of things that you see around. So for example, you know, if uh, one talks about urban design, it's not of large scale, it's not of city. In my personal understanding, simply put, it's a larger concern and not necessarily an act at a larger scale. Even if I do my house, but if I put a compound wall which is opaque, I'm shutting myself from the rest of the world. I'm shutting myself from the kind of street engagement. And if everybody did their walls like this, like we used to do it in colonial bungalows, it had no kind of a, nothing to do with uh, the city or the uh, street. And that's not an urban response. As against our traditional architecture, where there was a direct interface that houses opened onto the street with otas and so on and so forth. So even at a domestic scale, at a single house, you could still be thinking about your relation with outdoors which means with the rest of the world, which means with your neighbor, which means interactivity, which means visual continuity or not, which means one way privacy. That's how we had uh, uh, very creatively used the idea of a plinth that maybe from, if you do want privacy and still you want to be engaged with the outer world, you don't create wall, but you have high plinth. So you could look out at the world, but others would not directly pick in into most uh, kind of a privacy area of your domestic uh, activity, etc. We invented something called Jali, you know, perforated screen, where from inside you could see everything out. Even the queen could see the world outside, and but from outside you never knew what was going on inside with the light difference. Uh, so, so and so forth. So the point is that how do you situate yourself with a concern from for a larger thing? So the point is that Therefore, understanding of the context and being relevant to that, being appropriate. There's nothing like good or bad. It's always appropriate or inappropriate and appropriate in a larger context of place, people and program. I consider our practice to be research based where uh, every project we tend to analyze for the core ethos. Also, what is there in for us? It's not always the money. Somewhere it is an idea that we want to demonstrate. Somewhere it is the kind of a quest and a query to explore, whether it's technology, whether it's a kind of a typology, whether it's the integration of environment in one way or the other, whether it's like uh, drawing the light in case of a slum settlement uh, without touching uh, any periphery because you don't have that chance. And likewise, so each project comes with the bundle of opportunities, what you want to explore. We have a slum house intervention on one end to we have been doing a multi crore uh, memorial for a corporate to a large uh, institutional complex to some bit of uh, residential and interior. So it's not the project type, it's not that uh, kind of scale as a bar, but I think it's the sort of uh, design challenge and the concern in every project that drives us uh, through. First of all, it's a very home-based, but very transparent and open office. Uh, so there are no barriers. I'm uh, seen and heard by everybody in my office. So it's not just simply what I say they translate, but I think there's a, each layer that can contribute. So that's been one. Second, uh, we don't have neither the receptionist, nor the peon, nor the driver, nor anybody else. So it's all, all done by us and that was with an idea that it creates that sense of belonging that it feels like one group and family that even if it's mine and I'm involved and that also helps us keep our overhead down so that 
we are able to do many projects without any architectural fees, so to say. And yet those projects have been fully detailed and involved with most of our awards have come from such involvement, you know. Other thing is that uh, we've always spent a lot of time in researching before we arrive at a solution. So iterations and iteration starting with the pure theoretical research. So people often ask that, how where do you get time to write books and stuff like that? I don't think we can ever set aside such time, you know. I think you have to have that killer instinct. Whatever you do, find 10 things that can be brought out of that. So for example, many of these books or whatever articles, etc., have emerged out of a quest that you had either for a project or when you did certain study, something else came about. And that quest has led to certain amount of clarity and conviction. And that has made to coerce into a lot of exploration and iteration. And in that, while we of course have computers uh, to produce drawings and do things, we have relied still a lot on the handmade models and the development processes which uh, become the sort of uh, uh, basis for us to go step by step into different possible avenues. So every day it's a kind of a new way of looking at the same old thing. And I think it's that idea that I carried from Vastashri Foundation, working with models and using that tool to develop design, not to just show it to client as a presentation thing. People ask what have been the design challenges or what has been your thing with the client and whatnot. I, as, as I say that uh, creation of an architect is in what you create, even in a drawing, whether it realizes on site or not, that is for circumstances. So nobody can take away that from you. So even if a client comes and turns around your design, so what? You created something, didn't you? It's like a painter, whether his painting is sold or not, but he's created a painting. I always say that this is our creation. After that, when it comes to the ground and it fructifies, that's a bonus. The challenge is it in you. You have to set your own bar. So client always would come with the budget constraint or the legalities would allow you to do this or that. That's, that's I think, a reality. I don't take it as a challenge. It's like you go out and then it starts raining. Then you have to think of umbrella or you have to change your path in the shade. So it's more of that. But it's the goal of walking is what keeps you going. There have been many unfortunate episodes. Some clients would have fooled you around. He would have got everything done and never turned back at you. He would have filled, you know, pilfered your design. So all that happened. But what I see is that client became an excuse for you to engage into something. And as long as it kept you mentally nine to six occupied and gave you a creative, you know, play field, to work on, there's been never a loss. I always say that uh, if you stop longing for Monday morning, nine o'clock, I think you should retire. So it is that kind of a zeal that, okay, next day morning, I still have to catch up on this. If next day morning excites you, you're alive. If not, you're dead. We had a little uh, challenge in getting thesis guides. And I remember I had started with vertical element as constituent of space to be my theoretical thesis. Then for some reasons I dropped it and went to slum as an artifact or product of the way of life. So it was in a sense maybe poles apart, but to me both came very naturally to me. I was interested in both, you know. So while on one hand we learn from the long drawn history and the kind of experiential quality that they have shared even at transcending time and space at the same time we can equally learn from squatter settlements and slums being self-created environment built environment if i have enough money and i spend on something it may not say that that probably was really the need but if i'm scared with resource and still i spend on something that really speaks of that priority. And I think with frugal resources, how do you create a built environment which at least 
socioculturally and environmentally is comfortable. It may not look as neat. It may structurally have an issue, but if you go to slum, socioculturally, they are one of the most positive neighborhoods. You know, they can chat with each other. They're happy. They're laughing. And it at least is true to their lifestyle. Very first kind of project that I encountered when I was formally inducted in Vastashil Foundation after the Jaipur Development Authority was uh, Aranya Low Cost Housing. And that gave me a great chance to both understand the people and even my own design, I mean, dissertation in my undergrad thesis as well as masters had been around the slum and the kind of environment spontaneously created by them. So this fitted in very well and the kind of ethos and concern with which Aranya was designed to translate some of these understandings so that even though mass housing where people are anonymous and not known for, how can it come close to the lifestyle and aspiration of these people? And then uh, after the earthquake, another disaster, we were involved in about 18 entire villages rehabilitation and in that we tried this participatory design process, local solutions and different technologies suited to them where they themselves as user can participate in Aranya and many such subsequent projects gave a chance to apply some of these understanding into real projects and that gave a lot of conviction and what and this is something that I tried to share in my teaching. I do short workshops on these subjects and uh, I think the outcome is quite more satisfying to know that it's not just again the act of building but what is the socio-cultural dimension of what you create, well, how can it create neighborly bond and therefore a healthy society.